I love the way it comforts me. Welcome to Staying the Course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. Right. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Uh, we went to that Rancho Fest and uh, got some free water things the other day. Isn't that cool? Yeah, they're pretty nice, too. Yeah, so you can put the lid on and ah, living water. <laughs> if you guys need coffee, there's coffee downstairs. Feel free to, to get up. How's everybody doing? Good? Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day, and we just pray for all those traveling this morning, God, that you would be with them. For those that are sick, Pastor Chris and Soul, right now, we pray that you would just heal them, that uh, they would be blessed, Lord, in their home this morning. And God, I pray that you would anoint your word as it goes forth, that you would speak to each and every one of us, God, in Jesus' name, amen. We are still in the book of Leviticus, and we are still in chapters 8 and 9. What are those chapters all about? Who remembers? Aaron and his sons got ordained as priests, right? And so we've been talking about how we're royal priests, that we're a people devoted to God, and this morning it's experiencing the glory of God, part 2. As we get into chapter 10, all of a sudden, God's glory is going to fill the tabernacle, and all the people are going to see it. Have you ever felt or experienced God's glory in your life, his presence in your life? You know, I, for me, there's nothing more important than that. There is no greater time that I have than when I'm by myself worshiping God and experiencing his glory, experiencing his touch in my heart. And I want to talk about that this morning. Let me ask you a question. Are you experiencing God's glory in your life? Are you walking with God throughout the day or are you so caught up with the cares of this world that it seems his presence is fleeting? Two weeks ago, we talked about the anointing and empowering of the Holy Spirit. Remember what ordination means? It's two Hebrew words, right? Hada and Yad, and it means to come empty-handed and he fills the empty hands. That's ordination. We come to the Lord empty. We come to the Lord as sinners, and he cleanses us, forgives us. And this morning, God wants to meet with us here. Amen? Did you come expecting to meet with God, to hear from God? I do, and I'm preaching. <laughs> I know he's going to speak through me. You may find yourself stained by the mediocrity and sin of the world. Does that ever happen to you? You know, you go through, and it's just like, man, I need a shower. You know, what I just heard, what I just saw in the news, whatever it is, it's like, oh, and my heart is grieved with so many things in the world. Even some of the commercials are so anti-God, it's amazing. I saw a video clip of Bernie Sanders the other day. You know who that is? He was interviewing an appointee of Trump, and this appointee is a born-again Christian. Any of you ever see this interview? Okay, Mike saw it. Okay, I couldn't believe it. He essentially said... Christianity is not what this nation is about and has no Christian that believes that that's the only way to God has any business being in the political realm, being any, any politician. It was amazing to me. Every faith... Exactly. But universalists like him says that all faiths must say this. We're all just a different way to God. That's what they're after. Exactly. Right. You may have come to the sanctuary this morning battle weary. Maybe you felt like you've just been fighting the fight. You've been working too hard. You're burning the candle at both ends this morning. I got to tell you that God wants to give refreshment to your heart and your soul. And we're going to discover seven ways to experience God. I, I, I know it's like this is a topical. No, we're still in Leviticus chapters eight and nine. And uh, we're, they're in those chapters. 
There are seven things that Aaron and his sons did to experience the glory of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a, a list guy. Do you know what I'm talking about? A to-do list? Okay, if my wife needs me to do anything, if she asks me, I won't do it. You know, hey, Brett, could you do that? I'll forget. I'll, but if she puts a list on my computer, that list, something happens. I, I see the list. And it's like, I can't do anything else until I get all the things done on that list. And I will just pursue that. I, I will get it all done really quick. Do, any of you guys like that? Okay. Scott, yeah, we need to give him a hard time, right? I'm, I'm thinking of something to give him a hard time about, but I haven't thought of anything yet. And if you find yourself far from God this morning, he's really shown us in our text this morning the path to experience his glory to be refreshed in his presence. Aaron's anointing and ordination really provides an example for us, a path to open up really the floodgates of heaven and have his manifest glory revealed in our life. Can we find meaning in the Old Testament? That's a question people have asked, and I just want to remind us this morning, in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says this, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. What does that include? The whole Old Testament, all of it. Man, whatever was written in the Old Testament, he's saying it's written for our instruction so that through perseverance, and what is that again? Cheerful endurance, right? It's not just enduring, woe is me, I'm going to get through this. It's like cheerfully enduring. Wow, man, Lord, I'm in the midst of this battle, but I know you've got me. I know you'll hold me through it. And encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Verse 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now these things happen to them. What things? What, what was Paul talking about there? Hey, it, he's talking about Exodus when the children of Israel left Egypt and what they do, man, they worshiped a golden calf. They sat down to eat. They stood up to play. He said all of that was written as an example for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. In 2 Timothy, we all know this, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture, not just some of them. You can't pick and choose. You know a lot of people do that today. They, they, they even in the New Testament, they will read and say, Oh, okay, uh, these two verses apply to us, but the next three verses, oh, no, that only applied to the church back then, not us. It all applies to us. God's word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Man, it's inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And what's righteousness? Faith plus love. That's all it is. It's not doing all these holy things and thinking, man, I'm so holy, look at me. It's, man, I have complete faith in God, and I love him with all my heart, and I love my neighbor as myself, and I love the folks in the church just like Christ loved me, so that the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Are we royal priests? Absolutely. Absolutely. When we, we've been camping on Leviticus 8 and 9, and in these chapters there are seven things that they had to do in order to experience the glory of God. And we're going to go through the first three of the seven this morning. Next Sunday is what? It's a special Sunday. Father's Day. So don't forget, wives, you know, you just, you know, get, get your husband, you know, something small. And uh, so we will do a special Father's Day message next week and then the following week finish the seven uh, things that we need to do to experience the anointing and glory of God in our life and I tell you what every promise in this book is provisional what does that mean yeah it's conditional it means if you do this then God will do that hey seek first kingdom of God and his righteousness all your needs will be met delight yourself in the Lord and he will what grant you the desires of your heart Every promise in here is conditional. It's something that we do that in response, God then blesses us with. It's just like your kids. When they're obedient, when they're good, you want to bless them. When they're disobedient, man, you, want, you have to discipline them. 
In fact, in Hebrews, God said, I discipline those I love. All right. However, uh, as we've been going through these chapters, we didn't focus on the process of being ordained. And they had to do seven things in order to experience the anointing and ordination of God. And we're going to go over these seven steps. What they are quickly is this. Number one, they were washed. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 6. And Moses had Aaron and his sons. They're all descendants of the tribe of Levi. Remember, the Levites became the priests. Come near, and he washed them with water. Now, think about this. Christ washed the disciples' feet, right? Peter said, hey, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And what did Christ say? Man, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in my kingdom. And then Peter said, what? Man, wash my whole body. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the whole thing is, this washing is the first step in salvation and getting to the point of experiencing God in our lives. And we're going to talk about that more later. Number two, he clothed them, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 7. And he put a tunic on them and girded them with a sash and clothed them with a robe. So are you seeing the process? First, they were washed. Second, they were clothed. And we're going to talk about that. Number three, they were consecrated. The tabernacle first, Leviticus 8, verse 10. Moses then took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And Aaron, second, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 12. Then he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. The third step, and that's as far as we're going to make it this morning, is when we are living our lives fully devoted to God. When we are consecrated to God, and we're going to talk about that and what it means. The fourth step is atonement. Now, it's really interesting. Were these guys already saved in uh, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1, when they were washed? Oh, yeah, they believed in God. They were there. This is an atonement that is an ongoing in the Hebrew. The idea is this. Once you're saved, do we still need substitutionary atonement? Every time we sin, guess what? Christ still atones for that sin. It is an ongoing, not a finished work, but a continual work like sanctification. Does that make sense? That's where the Bible says, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. So this atonement uh, is uh, when Moses made atonement for the Levitical priests so then they could make atonement for the sins of the nation. Christ made atonement for us, the substitutionary. Then there's communion, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 26, and chapter 8, verse 30. From the basket of unleavened bread, he took the bread, and right after that, Moses took the blood and the anointing oil and went to the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron. It is in communion we remember that great price that Jesus paid on the cross of Calvary. Next week we'll be receiving of the Lord's table in communion. After communion, that's when ordination took place. Now it's really interesting. Can you imagine Aaron and his sons? They were washed. They were clothed with these high priestly robes. Beautiful. He had the the, that thing with all the jewels on it. You know the breastplate and. You could see that, man, we're ready to be priests for you to your people. And what did God make him do? We're going to talk about this in three weeks. He made him wait seven days and do nothing. They that wait upon the Lord will do what? Renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And, folks, there's something about waiting in the presence of the Lord. Who ordained Aaron and his sons? Moses or God? God did. And it's during those seven days of waiting. They were all dressed. They were ready to serve. And God said, all right, now you just have to sit by the tabernacle for seven days and do nothing. And in those seven days, as you're waiting, I myself am going to anoint you and ordain you. And we'll get into that. Then they went into the ministry. They blessed the people, Leviticus chapter 9, verse 22. And as soon as they did that, God's glory came, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. So these seven steps, I believe, are things that we can do to experience God's, really, presence in our lives. 
This morning, we're going to go through the first three of how to experience God's glory and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And the three are this, washed, and we're going to find out we are washed in the new covenant by these things, the word of God, confession, the Holy Spirit, and obedience or faith. Because once you believe, faith without works is what? Dead, exactly. And then we're clothed with righteousness, power, light, and the armor of God. And we put on those garments of praise. And then we're consecrated or literally sanctified, set apart to be wholly devoted to God. These three things. Number one's washed. In Leviticus 8, 6, again, Moses took Aaron and his sons and they came near and he washed them with water. He removed the physical dirt from their body, but now we are washed by what? The Holy Spirit who removes the dirt and the filth from our heart and our conscience. It's interesting, baptism means to wash. In fact, the idea is even more than washing, there's two words for baptism in the Greek. One is baptismo and the other one is, I forget, but <laughs> in the Greek. But baptismo means to wash, you know, physically wash. And the other one means to submerge. And we didn't know exactly what it meant, but we found a recipe for pickles Back written during this time. And this guy, Nick Cantor, wrote the recipe of how to make pickles. And he said, first you take a cucumber and you baptismo it. You wash it. And then you baptisme, let's just call it that. I forget the Greek word. And that's when you submerge it into vinegar and you let it set until it is changed. And that's the baptism often in the New Testament when it talks about we're baptized with Christ. We're baptized by the Holy Spirit. It's to be fully immersed and changed. Isn't that interesting? I love that. But no, there are two Greek words. Uh, for One's wash and the other one's to fully immerse or sum, submerge. Uh, even a, a, a log that is uh, water saturated, you know, they won't float, they sink. Uh, the word baptisma is used, the other Greek word for it. Really interesting uh, in the Greek. When we put our faith in Jesus, we are washed from the stains of sin. I want to tell you this. For God so loved the world, the simple gospel, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The minute you believe you are washed, the Holy Spirit comes in and you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. You become a precious son or daughter of God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 says, Let us then draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The first step, if you really want to experience the presence and glory of God in your life, is to be washed, to be cleansed by the Lord, to come to him and ask him to cleanse you and remove the filth of the word. Uh, world. Revelation 7, 14, it says, I said to him, my Lord, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones, and in the vision, John saw this great multitude in heaven that no one could count from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. I believe it's at that point the rapture took place. And he said, these are those that came out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in what? The blood of the Lamb. They were white as snow. 1 Corinthians six eleven. such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Notice the progression there. Washed is first. Then you're sanctified. What is that? To be set apart for exclusive use by and for God. And at the same time, you're justified just as if you're never sent. So wash with the word. We're going to go over all the ways we're washed in the new covenant. I want to tell you this. As a child of God, you need to be reading the Word of God. Every day you should be in the Word. Whether you listen to it on tape while you commute to work, whether you park the pages of the book, whether you pull it up on your iPhone or cell phone or whatever you do, the Word of God somehow washes our minds and our heart and gets us in the right place so that we can walk with God during the day. The Bible tells us this, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for those that are in the world, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? You see, the world out there, even us, needs to hear the word of God. And how will they preach unless they are sent? For it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news of good things. So washing by the word, we know in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. How she sanctified? Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. First thing is washed, then they're sanctified. Are you with me? Okay. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. We're also washed through confession, number two. So number one, we're washed by the word of God. It cleanses our heart. It gets our thoughts to think about God. You ever have a scripture come up when you're tempted about something and the Holy Spirit brings a verse up and says, oh, man, thank you, Lord, for reminding me that. Or when you're talking to someone and God brings up the word, wash through confession. In Psalm, why don't we turn there, 51, starting at verse 1. This is when David, right after he was caught committing adultery with Bathsheba, he wrote this. When Nathan approached him and confronted him on his sin, I find it interesting that before Nathan confronted him, David didn't repent. He didn't confess it, but after Nathan confronted him, we find this, verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. O wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted unto you. David, after he did this great sin, what did he do? He not only committed adultery, but he did what? Yeah, he murdered uh, her husband. And he wasn't convicted. He didn't repent. But finally, Nathan, the prophet, had the guts to go up to him and say, man, David, remember he told him the story? Let me tell you a story, David. That's how he confronted his sin. There was a guy, he had one lamb. It was his precious lamb. And uh, his neighbor had a whole flock of lambs, but he went and took that one lamb. What should I do with him? And David said, man, we're going to kill him. And Nathan said, you're the guy. Mm. Cleanse me, Lord. Oh, and I will be clean. No matter what you've done, the good news is God cleanses us from all sin. We're washed or cleansed. First John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess. Hey, is this a conditional promise? It is. Is it necessary to repent and confess? Yes, it is. When we sin, we need to do that. If we confess our sins, oh, then he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I will cleanse them, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 8, from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned against me and by which they have transgressed against me. We're washed also by the Holy Spirit. So how are we washed so far? Being in the word of God and confessing sin, right? Okay, if you feel far from God, if you feel dirty, if you feel condemnation from the enemy, 
Man, get into the word of God and go before God and confess your sins. And the next step is ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and baptize you, which is another word for what? Wash you. Baptism is washing. That's literally what it means. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Folks, we need to invoke the Holy Spirit's power in our lives to wash us. Verse 6, whom he poured out on us, that idea of living water. You know, Christ, on the last day of the feast, he stood up and said, anyone who's thirsty, let him come to me and drink, meaning a spiritual thirst. And this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which had not been given yet, but would be given to all who believed in him. It's not just the word. It's not just confession. It's the Holy Spirit as well that washes us. We need that washing or baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the fourth thing is obedience. You know, the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. It's more than just reading the Bible or coming to church and hearing a sermon. It's doing what God has told us to do in his word. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his face in a, in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what kind of person he was. You see, the idea is the Bible reveals things in us that we need God to either remove or we need to change. Amen? Verse 25, but the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. And what is that law? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself and abides in it. By it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. What's the conditional promise here? Hey, you hear the word of God, you do it. Man, this man, you will be blessed in what you've done and what you do. All right. We must be washed by the word of God and obedience to the word. Washed by obedience, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your soul's for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Hey, how do we purify our souls? By simply obeying the word of God. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. Amen. Are you washed? Do you feel clean this morning? You know, I have done stupid things, and the stupid things I do, I call sin. <laughs> Anyone else do that occasionally? You ever do it, and you're like, oh, why did I say that, or why did I do that? And then the guilt starts coming. Do you ever get the guilt? Okay, good guilt leads to what? Confession. Ah, Lord, man, I'm so sorry. Lord, wash me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. That's it. Then you rise up like David. What did David do right after he wrote this psalm that we read, Psalm 51? Man, he got up and danced in the street in his underwear, right? We talked about that a few weeks ago, maybe last week. He rejoiced because now he knew he was cleansed and forgiven. We do not let guilt rob us of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We repent, we confess, we're washed, and we press on. Amen? Remember, we're washed by what? The Word of God, get into the Word. Confession, repent of sin. By the Holy Spirit, be empowered or baptized, washed in the Spirit, and by obedience. Don't just be an ineffectual hearer of the Word, but an effectual doer of the Word. Praise God we're washed, amen? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 again, uh, and I'm going back a verse, I want to read 10 again. Or do you not know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will enter the kingdom of God. 
Such were some of you. Oh, but saints of God, this morning you were washed. You were sanctified. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Amen? That is the good news. The gospel in a nutshell. Once we're washed, the next thing Moses did to the sons of Aaron and Aaron himself was clothe them. I just want to go over the priestly clothing that we put on. He put a tunic and girded them with a sash and clothed them with a robe. Once we believe and are washed by the word of God, confession, the Holy Spirit, and obedience, we are saved, and then we are clothed with his righteousness, but more than that as well. Jesus clothes us or imputes his righteousness. In Job chapter 21, 14, it says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. Revelation 19, 8, speaking of the raptured saints, the church, it says it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Isaiah 61, 10, it says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. We put on Jesus, Romans 13, 12, The night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, and let us behave properly as in the day not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. Last week was Pentecost, and we talked about another garment we put on. In fact, it says in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, And you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with what? Power from on high. It's how we become victorious in Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Philippians 4.12, it says, I know how to get along with humble needs, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, every challenge we face, we can get through it with the power of the Lord. Amen? Mm. John 16, 17 says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage I go away. This is Jesus speaking. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, speaking of the Holy Spirit. Pretty powerful stuff. We're clothed with armor, Romans chapter 13, verse 12. The night is almost gone, the day is near. Hey, put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And it's God who clothes us, not we ourselves. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 33, it says, Why do you worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear? I do that a lot. Luckily, God helps me out with garage sales. This is another garage sale shirt. Isn't that great? (laughs) Isn't that awesome? I get so blessed. I mean, it's like, I love it. I love it. I go to a regular store now. It's like, I am not paying 20 bucks for a shirt. I get them for two or three bucks. You You guys should try it. Go to a garage sale. He says, man, why do you worry about that? Hey, don't all the birds of the field and the lilies of the valley and the flowers, are there, in all their grandeur, they're clothed more than the splendor of Solomon himself. How much more will God clothe you? And he ends that in verse 33 with the promise. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Oh, and all your needs will be met. He will see to it that your needs are met. We put on our uh, one more priestly garment. Isaiah 61.3. To appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I got to tell you, the Lord loves it when we praise him and worship him. There's something about corporate praise and worship But I think more importantly, when you're by yourself and you're worshiping God, it is precious in his sight. 
He so longs for that. Spurgeon said this when preaching on Isaiah 61.3. He says, wear it because it will comfort you. Wear it also because it will distinguish you from others. It will be livery to you, and men will know whose servants you are. It will be regimental dress and show to which army you belong. It will be a court dress and manifest to what dignity you have attained. Man, are you clothed in righteousness? You see, your clothing is what people see. On uh, Mother's Day, we talked a lot about clothing. Mothers, man, you put on more clothing, strength and dignity. (laughs) Isn't that great? Actually, guys, we need that too. Really, our priestly garments is all about putting on Christ. It's no longer we who live, Paul said, but it's Christ who lives in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He clothes us with his righteousness and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, and it's then that we're consecrated or dedicated to the Lord, and that's the third step that we're going to get to today. Consecrated, they did the tabernacle first. So Moses, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 10, took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle. When we moved into this place, we anointed the doors, we anointed the pulpit, we anointed the communion table. We went around and dedicated this place to the Lord. It's really consecration. And secondly, he anointed Aaron himself, Leviticus 8, 12, and he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Two ways we are consecrated. First, our temple, that's what? Our body. Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee immorality in every... Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, but you've been bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. I believe that going to the gym is a good thing. Paul said, man, physical activity benefits what? A little But, man, spiritual stuff, man, that benefits forever. So we need to not only go to the gym, keep healthy, keep our temples healthy. We should try to do that. Eat a lot of pizza. Oh, no, that's not healthy. (laughs) I I got to, is there a healthy pizza? Is there? Where where do you get it? (laughs) Oh, moderation. Yeah, that's right. Here's what's interesting. When I was in high school and my, my, in my first few years in college, no lie, I could eat a large pizza and half another large pizza myself in one setting. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it was crazy. And I was, I was skinny, but I ran. I ran a lot. I ran like four times a day. So I was a runner back then. Then I hurt my back and I stopped running. And now I'm just... Yeah, right. <laughs> Woo. Man, Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Folks, you that are married, be faithful to your spouse. Don't betray that trust. Don't betray that bond, that unity. You honor God and the temple of the Holy Spirit by being faithful to your spouse. And together, you actually become a sanctuary. Do you know that? Our bodies are the temple, and the Bible says a man is to leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two become what? One flesh, meaning they become a temple together, a sanctuary together. Mm. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And then we consecrate our thoughts. That's who we are. That's representative of Aaron. So Moses first consecrated the temple. Then he consecrated Aaron. Us, who we are, is our thoughts. Are we anything else? Our personality, could we say that? 
In fact, our emotions, who we are as a person inside this tent that is going to pass away, this mortal coil, even our thoughts need to be consecrated. In fact, Jesus said what, or Paul said what? Take every thought captive to obedience to Christ. Also this, Romans 8, 5, for those who are according to the flesh, set their thoughts, their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. How do you do that? Set your mind on the Spirit. For me, i got to worship God. That, that's how I do it. I put on a praise CD. Or I get into the Word of God, so I'm thinking about spiritual things. When I meet someone that's in trouble, and it happens a lot, uh, not last night, the night before, I think I got to bed like at 11. I'm having a hard time falling asleep. And at 2 o'clock, my pager goes off for the fire department, 2 a.m. And it was a three-year-old who died in Laguna Niguel. I met the couple at the hospital. I got there. Man, don't cry. It, it was heartbreaking. It was, it was so heartbreaking. And, and they were, you know, that deep groaning that words can't, in, in that emergency room, and, and you know what I'm talking about, this was in the trauma room where they had just worked this, this young little child trying to bring it back, and they couldn't do it, and they were weeping, holding its lifeless body, and I remember on the way there, it's like, what do, what do I tell them? You know, what do you tell a family that's lost a child? And I don't even remember what I said, but I do know this. It got their thoughts off of the tragedy and on, onto the Lord, and it was comforting to them in that moment. Does that make sense? You see, what we think about is important. The Bible says whatever is good, whatever is pure, oh, whatever is uh, just awesome and good, a loose paraphrase, what, all these good things, think about, dwell, meditate on these things. So often we focus on the negatives of life, don't we? You know, oh, woe is me. Man, that person did that. This is negative. Uh, we look around and this weight of negativity and all these thoughts just fill us and we get so overwhelmed and we get anxious and we carry this weight. And the Bible says, man, cast those cares on the Lord because he cares for you. Think about the good things. I think I sang that song or told you about when I was a child. And things would weigh on me. I would sing the song, Count Your Blessings, right? Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. And I will remember I would do that, and it helped. I thought about the good, not the bad. I wanted to be positive rather than negative. Even our emotions need to be consecrated to the Lord, and that's part of who we are. Philippians 4, 6, hey, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I need that. You know, some Christians have told me, well, I don't want to bother God with this. He wants you to. Even the little things. Man, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Finally, brethren, verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about, dwell on, meditate on these things. Experiencing God's glory, man, in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. You want to experience God's presence in your life? Man, we need to consecrate ourselves to God because before he blesses, he's looking for a, a consecrated people. Consecrate literally means sanctification. It means clearly uh, quadaz in the Hebrew, a verb meaning to be set apart to be holy, to show oneself holy, to be treated as holy, to consecrate, to treat as holy, dedicate oneself completely. 
This year, our theme is what? Holy devotion to God, being a people devoted to God. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, such were some of you, but you were washed. Oh, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And that word sanctify in the Greek, hagiazo, literally means to make holy. That is ceremonially purify, consecrate, to be holy, sanctify. They go together. How do we consecrate ourselves? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. Just a few ways. It's really simple. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of what? The word of God and prayer. The word of God and prayer. We go back full circle. It's interesting, the armor of God. And I'm sure you've noticed this. Uh, we have the belt of truth, which is what? The Word of God. And then it ends with the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. So not only do we have the belt of truth, the Word of God, but the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Two bookends for the whole armor. You see, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Why do we need to be in the Word of God, and why do you think the enemy so tries to steal your devotion time away? Does that happen to you? You're like, man, I'm going to spend some time in the Bible, and inevitably the phone will ring, or something will break, or something will happen, or your dog will start tearing up the carpet, or you know, whatever it is. Some distraction will come because the enemy knows if you are a man or woman that's in this book, you are going to have that belt that holds you together of truth. You're going to have the sword of the Spirit to be able to fight off the attacks of the enemy. It's sanctified by the Word of God and prayer. We need both. But God doesn't hear all prayers. Remember we went over this. Six things he done that will totally block your prayers from God. If you're selfish or act with wrong, ask with wrong motives, God will not answer or hear your prayer. James chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. If you're not in the Word of God or rejecting Scripture or God's instruction, Proverbs 28, 9 says, God will not hear your prayers. If you refuse to forgive or have unforgiveness or an unbelieving heart, Mark chapter 11, verses 20 through to 26, you can look these up later, God will not hear your prayers. You know, people all the time say, why doesn't God answer my prayers? I go through this litmus test with them. Number four, family discord. If you're not honoring each other as fellow heirs of the kingdom, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, your prayers will be blocked or hindered. Number five, doubt, lack of faith. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8, he who doubts should expect not to receive anything he asks. Number six, habitual sin. And I mean unrepentant, unconfessed, habitual sin. If you do that, God will not hear your prayers. You can take a picture of that. My students uh, in our college class, they take pictures of the slides up there. They're like, wait, and they get their cell phones out. And <laughs> You know, there's one, uh, it's not in all the manuscripts, but remember when the disciples came to Christ and they said, man, we can't cast out this demon. Remember this story? And he said, man, this kind only comes out with what? Prayer and fasting. So the idea, if I really need a miracle, first of all, I'm going to examine myself. Am I meeting all of these things? Remember, the promises of God are conditional. Am I doing all of that? And then I will fast and pray, and I see miracles all the time from the Lord. Are we ready? Okay. God is calling us in this morning, and we approach him through prayer, praise, and worship. Jesus said in Matthew 6.6, 6, But you, when you pray, go into your room. 
what did you call it this morning, Russ? The War Room. <laughs> All right. If you haven't seen the movie, you need to see it. Hey, go into your war room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who sees in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Folks, I know it's so important that we spend time with the Lord by ourselves in our prayer closet. Not just corporately, but when we're alone, finding that war room, that prayer closet. Prayer is a Christian's privilege and honor because we have an audience with the creator of the universe. I don't go to prayer lightly. I, I used to. There was a time in my life, hey, what's happening? Big guy upstairs, you know. And, but now it's like, man, as we've been studying Exodus and the tabernacle and, and, and approaching God through the tabernacle model of prayer, which we'll talk about in two weeks again as we uh, get into the last part of these seven steps. It's an honor and it's a privilege to approach Almighty God, King of the universe in prayer. God is near to all those who call on Him, the Bible says. And in Acts 17, 27, it says, Man, so that they would seek the Lord and hope that they might grow for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Amen? He's right there. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. <clears throat> God hears our prayers, 1 John 5, 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. He wants us to approach Him in prayer. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and find grace and help in time of need. That's why we need to consecrate ourselves to the Lord, to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. If Anyone cleanses himself, 2 Timothy 2.21, of these things, he'll be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Everywhere we go, we go as ambassadors. So the promise that we have as we go through these things, these steps, is that at the end we will experience the glory of God in our life. You know, all of us continue to sin. When's the last time you sinned? For me, it was a week ago. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Probably this morning. I don't know. But we have this promise. My little children, 1 John 2, 1, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate, an attorney with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that leads to step four, which we'll get into next in two weeks, not next week. God's calling us this morning, amen? Whether you're a seasoned saint or simply seeking to know that he's real, God this morning is drawing us to him. He wants us to approach his throne. He wants to turn your ashes to beauty, your hurt to hope, and your fear to faith. He wants to know you, amen? Come on up, worship team. God bless you. If you need prayer, uh, I'll be back in the back to pray with you. <laughs> Strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my need. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, Contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve him. Remember, stay the course and we'll see you next week.